be here. Nice to see you. Well, I guess we're ready to begin. Okay, Good morning, great. everyone, and welcome to Our Homes Ending the Housing Crisis. Our guest today is Stefan Pellegrini. He's an architect, urban designer, planner, and teacher who believes that design plays an important role in providing equity and encouraging social and environmental justice in our cities. As a principal with Opticos Design, Inc., he provides design and thought leadership at all building scales with a particular emphasis and interest in tools and solutions for small towns and rural communities. Recently, Opticos has been in the news because of its leadership role in promoting missing middle housing and car-free communities, including the innovative cul-de-sac Tempe development. Welcome to our home, Stefan. Thank you very much, Senator Tang. It's uh, really lovely to be here today. Okay, great. Well, the floor is yours. You can take it away. Okay, thanks. Well, I um, uh, prepared a brief presentation today um, to talk a little bit about our work at Opticos and what we're doing in the field of missing middle housing. And then I'm really looking forward to uh, having a conversation with you uh, and all the folks who have joined us um, to talk more about this and other topics that are related to some of the issues that you're experiencing uh, currently in Hawaii. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and take everybody through the presentation. Okay, well, um, hopefully everybody can see that on my screen. And again, I wanna thank Senator Chang for inviting me here today and uh, really look forward to um, spending the next hour with you. Um, I'm gonna just start by giving everybody a background in missing middle housing uh, and uh, why we feel it's important. So uh, we've had really an opportunity to work with communities all over the country uh, in terms of meeting different kinds of housing needs. And what we're experiencing uh, is really sort of a perfect storm of conditions in that um, we have a variety of shifting household demographics occurring uh, as the, the makeup of Americans changes. Uh, we see significant trends towards single person households uh, towards households which are getting older. And in fact, by 2030, 20% of Americans will be over the age of 65. Uh, uh, we also are seeing uh, incredible increases in childless households, uh, as well as the growth of uh, minority populations, uh, in particular, uh, Latino populations, um, who uh, by 2050 will account for 60% of the nation's population growth. And what we see is that significant percentages of the, these demographic makeups are actually looking for different kinds of environments and neighborhoods to, look, uh, uh, to live in. And that uh, this is in sharp contrast to the majority of the housing stock that we have in this country, uh, which continues to be predominantly uh, single family detached homes. So there's a current mismatch and an even growing mismatch between the housing stock that we have um, and the housing types that we need uh, to house these different kinds of households. Um, and we're also seeing this at the same time that housing demand is uh, really increasing rapidly and that's happening in parallel uh, with uh, the cost of construction, which is sort of rising. And many of you uh, have probably uh, experienced this firsthand as land costs, the cost of materials and labor uh, and entitlements have continued to increase. A lot of news uh, recently about the uh, rapid increases in rents uh, that are tied uh, to sort of many of these um, aspects. This is all tying to uh, a real crisis of affordability. And uh, just four years ago, nearly a third of households were housing cost burdened, uh, meaning that uh, 
they were uh, putting forward uh, more than a third of their household income uh, towards housing and housing related costs. And this has only worsened uh, in the last four years. So uh, we at Opticos are very interested in understanding how missing middle housing uh, can be used uh, and leveraged uh, to really sort of deal with some of these uh, crises that we're seeing um, in housing today. So when I say missing middle housing, I'm speaking specifically about house scale buildings uh, with multiple units uh, in walkable neighborhoods. And uh, this diagram sort of demonstrates the range or spectrum of missing middle housing that we typically see uh, in American communities. And this happens at a scale that is in between uh, detached single family homes and what most markets have actually gotten pretty effective at actually building, which is uh, complex mixed use uh, in uh, mid-rise buildings uh, of four to six or eight stories or more. Um, but the, 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 the middle scale of housing in particular that is compatible with single family homes uh, is missing uh, for sort of a variety of reasons, um, which uh, I will uh, be talking a little bit more about today. Um, and we think that this is actually sort of really important to sort of try to reframe the way we discuss housing choice. Um, and so about um, five years ago, we launched uh, an open source website, missingmiddlehousing.com to start to document and call attention uh, to missing middle housing. Uh, and then my longstanding business partner uh, last year uh, collaborated with our office to uh, produce a book on missing middle housing um, to uh, really sort of spread the message and what we've learned about missing middle housing. Um, uh, I mentioned that what's important to sort of think about here is that uh, housing is house scaled uh, and we're looking at housing that is compatible in a variety of ways with single family environments. And that could mean that it actually could be inserted into single family neighborhoods or it could be placed and considered in many ways that are adjacent and compatible with single family neighborhoods. And one of the reasons why we call it missing is that uh, prior to uh, World War II, uh, this kind of housing was actually fairly prevalent uh, in American communities. Uh, but due to a variety of factors, including the way we finance housing, the way we've zoned housing, uh, the way we shifted towards uh, Euclidean zoning patterns, uh, that are uh, prevent sort of mixed use or mixed family environments to occur, we've seen a gradual decrease in the production of housing units uh, to the point that uh, by 2013, uh, less than 10% of all housing units produced in the United States uh, were uh, could be considered a missing middle scale. Um, as I mentioned, the market used to sort of be much more active in providing this kind of housing. Uh, these actually are images from a Sears and Roebuck house catalog uh, from the 1920s. As many of you know, uh, Sears was really active um, in providing kits to build housing on uh, privately owned parcels. They would deliver these kits via train with a set of instructions and all the nails and tools that you needed uh, to build the house. And uh, because uh, these uh, parcels were in sort of more open regulatory environments, it allowed for housing to sort of more closely respond uh, to market demands. And of course, uh, many of these housing types today is uh, what we could actually sort of consider to be naturally occurring affordable housing. These are sort of holdovers or, holdovers or leftovers from a time uh, when this housing was actually uh, more easy to construct and build uh, that have continued to provide a supply of diverse housing types uh, for our communities today. I wanna emphasize that uh, missing middle housing is middle in two different ways. Uh, the first is that it's middle in terms of its form and scale, and that it has sort of a physical compatibility between single family and multifamily buildings. And one of the things that's important to think about here is that the height, width, and depth of buildings all matter, particularly when you're actually inserting things into single family environments. And that it's important to actually regulate those things uh, that actually may not be regulated when we're thinking about um, how um, multifamily housing is occurring today. Missing middle housing is also uh, important in terms of its ability to deliver 
housing that's affordable by design. And this is largely because uh, missing middle housing can be produced in a way um, that is supportive of infill housing that um, can rely on lower land costs, lower construction costs because it's being delivered in a more economically feasible development type. We use the term type five construction to refer to wood framed buildings as opposed to podium style or concrete framed buildings. They can be smaller units, which can be made affordable. Um, and they actually can occur incrementally uh, by local developers actually in terms of, like, instead of being um, required uh, sort of by outside investment for sort of larger uh, developers to build. And we see this again, sort of meeting a need on a spectrum of affordable housing between larger scale projects, which actually might require heavy subsidies to occur um, and market uh, driven development on the other hand, uh, which is actually only meeting sort of certain elements or factors of the market. So where is missing middle housing found? And we typically look to areas that are supportive of walkability. It works best in neighborhoods, environments where a variety of housing types can be supportive. We see this in many neighborhoods today that were built prior to World War II, where we see a mix of these housing types, but it's not always so easy to differentiate the number of units uh, because the buildings all share a similar form and size. So when we think about where missing middle is appropriate, we wanna think carefully about uh, what we can walk or bike to, what uh, parts of a community are actually walkable, um, what amenities are nearby, and how can this be supportive of housing types that actually can occur uh, with lower parking? I'm gonna hit pause for just one second and I'll be right back. Thanks for that short pause. Um, so in terms of sort of thinking about that, I'm gonna talk about sort of two final things to actually sort of complete um, my presentation today. The first one is to sort of talk a little bit sort of about regulatory strategies that we're using to promote missing middle housing. And this has become sort of increasingly uh, important um, in the spectrum of what's happening um, in many, uh, within many of our um, jurisdictions where we're working. Uh, where housing needs have actually become so significant. Um, in California in particular, um, recent changes in state law have actually started to enable what we would refer to as by right housing. Uh, SB 35 and SB 330, both adopted in 2018, are both enabling streamlined development that actually needs to occur uh, without um, local discretionary approvals. Uh, they need to be approved by staff. And they're requiring actually what we're calling objective design standards, tools that staff can use to actually regulate um, uh, and uh, process these kinds of applications. Um, many of you actually also might be familiar with SB9 and SB10. We'd be happy to sort of talk about it a little bit more uh, today, um, which are also sort of enabling small scaled infill development to occur uh, in neighborhoods by right, particularly sort of in these single family environments. And these objective design standards are really sort of a necessary tool to provide sort of sort of a sharper, more precise instrument uh, to enable this kinds of missing middle housing. Um, we're working uh, with jurisdictions both in Hawaii and also in California on these kinds of objective standards. And it's really important to sort of understand how they can actually can be tailored uh, to meet local needs and to meet local compatibility uh, concerns and issues. It's not a one size fits all process to understanding how this uh, housing can be inserted into communities. So in Marin, we're sort of looking at strategies for local place types to understand how this actually can occur. Uh, we are writing highly prescriptive objective design standards to enable missing middle infill housing um, in different environments. And these actually in some situations are being regulated all the way down to sort of the architecture, the architectural details uh, which are so uh, prescriptive in terms of making the kinds of places uh, that these communities want to see occur. Um, there's also sort of a variety of sort of technical resources uh, which are uh, made uh, available today, um, including um, a recent documentation in, in zoning practice uh, that talks a little bit more about some of these form-based strategies um, in depth. 
And I'd be happy to answer sort of any additional questions about some of these regulatory strategies, including some that we're being applying on the island of Kauai for many years now um, to actually sort of meet their goals uh, for introducing missing middle housing um, in their communities. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about sort of some of the uh, projects that we are sort of implementing nationwide that actually sort of start to reflect uh, how the market is starting to respond in terms of providing new and innovative housing types. And one of the sort of elements they sort of wanna focus on here is that there's sort of a focus in shifting the thinking from housing type and desired form and away from density in terms of, sort of how we're actually can use these housing types to create communities um, as opposed to sort of necessarily sort of meeting a certain numeric or quantitative requirements. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about sort of two uh, particular projects that I think are sort of very interesting case studies. The first one is a greenfield project actually in Nebraska, bungalows on the lake at Prairie Queen. This is a 50 acre project that's providing an entirely multifamily product um, that is uh, housed within missing middle buildings organized into a neighborhood um, at a gross density of about 15 dwelling units to the acre. This was something that was sort of untested by local markets, but it actually has sort of uh, established a real untapped demand for multifamily environments and their ability to actually function more like a walkable single family neighborhood. And so um, this is a particular uh, situation where every single unit is in a house scaled building. Uh, there are no interior corridors and that sort of every uh, single building in the community actually has its own front door, its own access from the outside, and is a dual access unit, meaning it has an orientation both to the street and to a rear yard uh, space, uh, as opposed to sort of providing um, an environment where you're living um, on a corridor and have only orientation and light and air coming from one side. Really significant um, a difference in terms of how you might live um, in, um, in a multifamily environment. Um, this project in particular is very interesting because it's actually established uh, a new ceiling in terms of the demand for multifamily in the area. Uh, um, it is actually attaining rents at price per square foot that actually were not previously seen um, in the Omaha metro market. Um, the second um, uh, project that I wanna sort of touch on briefly is the cul-de-sac Tempe project that we've been working on for a few years um, its first project is actually located in Tempe, Arizona. Uh, this is a 16 acre infill project uh, that is delivering about 40 dwelling units to the acre um, on a site that actually is located along a, a light rail line uh, in um, suburban Tempe. Uh, they are providing only 16 parking spaces. It's an entirely car free development um, that is also entirely uh, market driven. Um, and so this is actually sort of pretty remarkable um, introduction in terms of sort of what the market is interested in supporting and delivering. Um, this is all occurring in a variety of two and three story buildings uh, that are organized along pedestrian paseos, many of which are designed for fire and emergency access, um, but are supportive of a car free environment. Um, it is uh, very competitive in terms of its vertical construction costs. And uh, it is providing comparable rents with amenities to other uh, market-driven projects in the Tempe area, uh, establishing a trade-off between the cost of infrastructure provided for parking and uh, the cost of infrastructure that is provided to support a high-quality, walkable, car-free environment. Um, this is done with a system of unique and repeatable building types, as I mentioned, our type five construction and can leverage sort of the most economical uh, construction uh, uh, typologies uh, that we have available to us. It is a 100% uh, rentable project. And again, they're all walk-ups. And so no units actually uh, are located actually along corridors um, or, uh, and the project is also avoiding um, extensive costs related to elevators. Um, and other um, issues that you see in larger complex mixed use buildings. Um, the courtyard sort of really provides sort of the primary living space. Uh, it's very high quality. 
And um, we're seeing sort of a real opportunity to deliver courtyard living that can foster a sense of community. Um, I wanted to sort of point this out. The previously entitled project was very really similar in terms of size and density to provide nearly 700 units, but it required con the construction of complex mixed building, uh, mixed use buildings, much larger in scale and the inclusion of over 1400 parking spaces that would have required an additional subsidy of about $28 million uh, to bring this project to, to market. And you can see that the outcome here is a much more human scale project, uh, which is actually much more compatible uh, with the adjacent neighborhoods um, that the cul-de-sac project is inserted into. Cul-de-sac is very exciting. They're in the process of actually transitioning this concept uh, to uh, a sort of a national response. And they're in the process of sort of looking at other infill sites uh, nationwide uh, that uh, where they could actually sort of make uh, this idea of car-free living that's market-driven uh, a more consistent reality. And I mentioned some of the things about how this project is actually sort of responding um, in terms of um, providing amenities to support uh, car-free living and shared mobility. And these are just some of the ways that that's actually happening. Um, the uh, rents for um, units are actually incorporate um, on-site always available car share uh, so that um, residents have access to cars, uh, but can actually live in an environment where they actually don't need to own one. Um, ride share is something that actually is incorporated into the design of the project so that it's convenient to sort of all folks who live there. And there also is e-scooter infrastructure in terms of paths, parking zones, charging stations uh, to facilitate short trips and micro mobility built into the project. Um, and they're also sort of experimenting with some innovative things such as uh, sidewalk delivery robots that can actually replace the need for delivery trucks to actually meet or arrive um, at everyone's door uh, to make deliveries. So super interesting ways that the market is attempting to sort of deliver uh, missing middle housing uh, um, uh, that is uh, meeting some of these sort of untapped needs uh, that are seen within the market. So I'm gonna sort of conclude with that brief presentation now. I uh, really sort of, uh, we work at Opticos to really sort of think outside the box in terms of how we're sort of delivering uh, missing middle housing choices that has to do with sort of how we're kind of envisioning projects in the different communities where we work, but also sort of how we're thinking about regulatory tools and how we can sort of change zoning and entitlements to actually enable more missing middle housing in our communities. And we're really sort of looking towards technology and leveraging uh, 21st century ideas and concepts uh, to see how um, that kind of housing can actually be delivered uh, for to meet the kinds of housing needs that we see ahead of us. Um, so with that, I sort of invite all of you to uh, uh, learn more about missing middle housing. I welcome you to sort of visit our website um, at missingmiddlehousing.com. Um, and I look forward to uh, this discussion with Senator Chang, you and others uh, for the remainder of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan, for that uh, really intriguing presentation. We already have a number of questions coming in through the Q&A feature. And um, let me get one started with one that came in early. Um, you showed earlier a slide of the maximum dimensions of one of these missing middle buildings. Can you talk about where those numbers came from? Is that from the zoning code? Sure, and that's a really great question. Um, one of the things that um, we do when we sort of work on these sort of regulatory solutions is we look to see what the physical characteristics are in the neighborhoods where this kind of infill housing is expected to go. And introducing multifamily housing in single family environments is I think something that we sort of recommend be done with some care um, because multifamily buildings that are out of scale with uh, the existing single family patterns um, are not doing much in terms of neighborhood compatibility. They're also sort of reinforcing um, concerns and issues that many single family residents have about 
why they need to keep multifamily housing out of their neighborhoods. And what we see in um, some really good best practice neighborhoods is that the building size, the building footprint is consistent across housing types, regardless of whether they're single family or multifamily. Um, and I know Senator Chang, this is an issue that you've been having in some neighborhoods uh, in Honolulu, um, where um, uh, there are sort of a very large houses that are being built um, uh, purportedly for sort of multifamily purposes. And this gets into the sort of this issue of sort of trying to sort of right size development. Um, this can sometimes be a challenge when there's sort of a, because sometimes there are, there is sort of a gap between what the zoning code might allow and actually what might be built be being built today. Um, and you know, sort of something that we sort of think about is that we have a lot of single family neighborhoods in California that are one story environments. All houses are one story, but they're living in a zone district where you actually can build in many cases up to 35 feet today. And so when you start to see new construction in these, um, um, in these uh, neighborhoods, there can be an incompatibility between what's there today <laughs> and um, what you actually might be able to build under those current regulations. And many of those incompatibilities may not actually, the, the, the people who live in these neighborhoods may not even be totally aware. And so when we sort of do this work, it's really important to sort of try to uncover what the existing zoning allows and then try to understand how you can move that forward to sort of help inform what should be allowed if you are starting to introduce um, uh, middle or missing middle housing into some of these neighborhoods. All right, another question that's come in. What is the most effective process to create the zoning changes needed to encourage missing middle housing? Is it a top-down approach like Oregon has done or like the California bills you mentioned? Or is it best left at the county levels? I think that's a really wonderful question. I think what we're experiencing in California is that there are limitations to what both of those parties can do to, to sort of solve the extent or address the extent of the housing crisis. And I think there are in many ways, uh, I personally have sort of been very supportive and excited about what the state has done uh, in support of buy right housing and in support of uh, enabling different options uh, from, of, from single family housing uh, to occur. Um, but what we also see is that jurisdictions are all different and they bring different conventions with regards to how they like to review and discuss and approve development. They also are not made up of the same stuff. You know, they have different environments, different neighborhoods. And I think it's really important for sort of both of those entities to understand what they actually can contribute in terms of um, regula uh, regulatory strategies and solutions sort of meeting the health uh, crisis. And anyway, one way sort of that I can sort of help or try to sort of explain how that's sort of playing out in California is that SB 35, which basically established uh, at the state level, a way for certain kinds of affordable housing projects uh, to uh, be allowed within jurisdictions without discretionary approval, essentially buy right housing. If it, uh, it, if sort of, it was a mixed income project, number one, and number two, if it was presented in a jurisdiction uh, that had not met their low and very low income housing requirements uh, within their, um, their, their uh, uh, housing element cycle. And if those sort of two issues uh, uh, criteria were being met, um, it meant that a buy right project where only you could apply objective design standards um, uh, would need to uh, actually receive discretionary approval. And so what that's actually created is a situation where jurisdictions need to respond to that state law with tailoring objective standards that meet the needs of bringing that kind of project into their community. And it's not always sort of a one size fits all thing in terms of uh, what one community might need in terms of defining what that project should be like, might be very different from another, uh, another community. They also might have different geographies where those kinds of projects are actually possible um, that actually might need to sort of think about sort of calibrating uh, different kinds of standards. 
what we're seeing now on top of that is that there are additional needs for housing that jurisdictions are trying to meet. And they're seeing this sort of opportunity for where objective standards can be applied to provide other opportunities for streamlining uh, housing applications. Once they have objective design standards, they can meet these requirements for these by right SB 35 projects, but they can also start to sort of open the door to streamlining other kinds of housing projects, particularly if they sort of have some really high needs uh, to deliver housing because of their geography or if they're sort of located along a high quality transit line, for example. So we see cities starting to respond with those tools actually meet those needs which are not going to be the same from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So we sort of really kind of see the value of the state making the big moves where these really comprehensive ideas need to be sort of adopted and applied statewide, but we're also sort of providing opportunities for local jurisdictions to respond appropriately, to uh, calibrate the tools that they need to actually sort of meet their sort of local housing needs. Another question from the audience. What do you think is the maximum number of households per acre density level that's possible with a missing middle model? You mentioned 40 units per acre uh, was achieved in your cul-de-sac Tempe project, which was a car-free project. Is that the maximum? That's, I would say that that is sort of a good maximum to consider. When we think about missing middle scale buildings, we're typically thinking about buildings that are two and a half to three stories tall uh, and that they are at that scale, maintaining a compatibility with single family environments, either because they're intermixed, because they're adjacent. And um, that means that those are buildings that actually um, are only stacking three levels of units. Um, they, in many situations, can avoid corridors and maximize sort of the efficiency in terms of the size of the building and the amount of the buildings being taken up by units versus other space that's needed to circulate in a building, such as hallways um, and elevators. Um, we can sort of avoid sort of those pieces. So 40 dwelling units to the acre is sort of a pretty good threshold. We see examples in older communities, particularly in projects that are predominantly smaller units and have very little parking on site that actually are providing 48 60, sometimes 65 dwelling units to the acre. But we see that as sort of being pretty challenging today in terms of meeting uh, building code requirements and staying within the parameters um, of what the code requires uh, for two to three story buildings. But 40 dwelling units to the acre is certainly achievable. What's interesting is that in California, for example, many of the multifamily zone districts or the districts where multifamily is expected are capping out at around 25 dwelling units to the acre. And that there is sort of longstanding policy that promotes 25 dwelling units to the acre that is really reflective of apartment style complexes that have a very significant sort of on-site parking ratio and are units that are sort of organized into buildings that have corridors. And so what we see there is that there is sort of a gap that missing middle can fill. You can deliver much more intense uh, in terms of density dwelling into the acre projects uh, beyond 25 dwelling into the acre without introducing the scale of these complex mixed use buildings that um, start to actually sort of create other issues in terms of their expense, the build, meeting the building code, um, um, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so those are sort of important things that we're sort of seeing opportunities to sort of really close the gap um, and increase opportunities for missing middle housing. That density is sort of a key issue that in many jurisdictions needs to be overcome where you can sort of untap and open uh, development up uh, to sort of increase intensity that's still physically compatible. So speaking of the, increased intensity. We're familiar with a number of objections that are always brought up any time we increase density. Issues like uh, traffic, like noise, like parking. 
um, like the lack of infrastructure capacity, notably in Hawaii, wastewater capacity. How would you respond to concerns that the neighbors might have that, you know, this would, even though the buildings may look the same, if you have 12 people living in a building versus four people living in a building, that there will be all of these community impacts? Sure. And I think, you know, I often try to sort of parse out the kinds of impacts that can be quantified uh, versus the kinds of impacts that actually might be more about sort of emotional or sort of feeling concerns that sort of community members might have. So for example, we've talked a little bit about sort of neighborhood compatibility and how there are strategies to actually form and shape multifamily housing so that they sort of look and feel like single family housing and can be sort of compatible with those environments. That's one way that we can sort of think about how to quantify that. And things like building depth and building height are ways that we can sort of help deliver that. In terms of sort of the other impacts, I think one thing to remember is that um, many times the enabling missing middle housing and enabling higher density infill housing in neighborhoods actually creates an opportunity to build smaller units and uh, to encourage smaller units in a way that the occupancy of these buildings might actually be fairly consistent. And a way that actually might play out is that a fourplex, for example, that might be delivering 25 to 40 dwelling units to the acre, organizing four small units on a parcel with four parking spaces might actually operate in many of the same ways as a suburban four bedroom house with two adults and two teenagers <laughs> and four parked cars on site. Um, the occupancy and the way that they sort of measure impacts actually might be very similar uh, to what's happening. Um, and it's probably sort of important to sort of understand that um, in terms of that the housing choice and the opportunity to introduce smaller units into some of these environments is not necessarily going to increase the occupancy or the intensity in which the parcels and the buildings are currently being used. They're just enabling smaller units and enabling people from different families to sort of occupy the same zoning envelope in a way that they actually may not actually be possible to do today, uh, particularly if, if there are sort of regulatory restrictions. So I think those are sort of important things to sort of try to unpack. The parking issue, I wanna sort of dwell on that a little bit because I mentioned that a little bit before is that we usually look for places where there are existing opportunities for walkable neighborhoods, either in terms of infill or for new walkable neighborhoods to emerge. And one of the things that we look for there is to try to introduce multifamily housing where at least a portion of the vehicle trips can be offset or uh, shifted over to multimodal trips. And um, what we, typically look for there is environments that can support on average one parking space per unit. When we get to that sort of number of one per unit, it means that we can actually start to physically fit a much broader range of multifamily units in single family environments. It also means that the costs of parking as they relate to the cost of delivering the projects tend to trend more towards what's economically feasible. And we stop seeing issues where the need to provide certain numbers of off-street residential parking um, is what we would refer to as the limiting factor in development. It's, it's what starts to be what actually stops projects from occurring. But in order to sort of get to those numbers, you need to make sure that you can actually support households um, that can shift some of those trips away from a vehicle. And that means interconnected streets and blocks. It means pedestrian infrastructure, in some cases, bicycle infrastructure, sidewalks. It means a land use pattern where you actually 
can be close to some of the services and amenities that you need without needing to get into a car for everything. Um, and those don't necessarily need to be sort of intensive multi-story mixed use environments for that to occur. I think we can all think about neighborhoods that start to support neighborhood services um, that are not providing sort of the full range of amenities, but are providing a limited number of amenities that sort of help to offset some of those trips. So that's some food for thought to sort of think about um, when we um, think about this issue of compatibility. Speaking of the multimodal transportation, the cul-de-sac Tempe project is of course located in a Phoenix, Arizona suburb that is one of the most car dependent um, metro areas in the country. Cul-de-sac has already been built, hasn't it? And there are currently people living in cul-de-sac? Um, Thanks, is... Senator. It, it, it's under construction right now. Yeah, and they are looking at phase one occupancy uh, by next spring. I see, okay. Um, how, you know, for those of our audience members who might not be able to conceive of living in a, suburb, a suburban type of environment without a car, um, can you can you paint the picture of what it's actually like to live there without a car? How is it realistic that you can have hundreds or even thousands of people living without cars? Um, will they secretly park their cars on neighboring streets and use that to commute to and from work? Um, how do they get their groceries if they don't have the big SUV to drive to Costco? Yeah, it's super fascinating. And this is really interesting for us because it's a market-driven model in that they are providing car-free housing and car-free living uh, for residents, but they are trying to meet that need to people who are actually are making that choice. They're choosing to live in this environment. And then of course, the next question is, are there really enough people that actually would wanna live that way? Um, and what's interesting is that they basically, um, before they even started building, when they were ready for the project, they basically opened up the project to uh, folks who actually might have an interest in living there. And they got a group of about 3,300 people who were incredibly interested in living in a car-free environment. And what they actually then did with those 3,300 people is use them for feedback to refine the strategies and solutions that they were using to provide uh, car-free living. Um, and so that's actually been sort of really fascinating to see how that goes. I mentioned a little bit of sort of about the cost offsets. And the idea is that the, instead of paying for a parking space, which of course with, is built into your rent, or maybe it's sort of seen as an amenity that you could add on to your rent. And so let's say that costs $250 a month in, um, in, in Tempe, they are sort of thinking about that rent cost and shifting that $250 towards amenities that actually make it feasible for you to live without a car. And so that means that sort of, for example, built into your rent is a car share subscription that would allow you to use your cell phone to access a car uh, through a car share program whenever you needed one that actually would be parked on site. As I mentioned that there were 16 parking spaces um, in the whole, um, uh, the whole development. Uh, that is one of the reasons why those parking spaces are there to provide this sort of car share model. The other thing that they also provide is a grocery delivery built in again to your rent. And so that you can make the choice to live there, you can always choose to go offsite um, to go grocery shopping, but you have the ability to sort of receive groceries on site. And again, that's sort of built into um, the cost of your rent. Um, another thing that was super interesting for me is that they understood that there was a demand for folks who were interested in living in a multifamily environment where the units were smaller but they were actually coming from environments where they had access to sort of space outside their unit for other activities. And for many people that actually is a garage. And you can think about the things you can do from a garage. You can 
do home projects, you can do hobbies, you can do other things that you might sort of think about needing to give up as part of um, living in a multifamily environment. So they've built into the neighborhoods uh, these sort of shared multi-use spaces that are bookable and actually, again, included as an amenity in your rent so that folks who actually might be doing media production, um, other things that actually where they were relying on a garage or an external space in your single family home can still have access to that, but in an environment where it actually can be shared. And that actually is sort of super interesting, not something that I had expected. Um, they are seeing interest in like a really broad swath of uh, demographic. And I mentioned early in the presentation that there are uh, sort of both boomers and millennials and younger folks, percentages of those demographic groups that are interested in this kind of housing. And they are seeing demand from both of those groups. There's some people who actually are sort of in the process of downsizing, who are living in suburban environments today <laughs> that are basically choosing to go into these environments. There are other folks who actually are ready to leave walkable urban environments like Brooklyn or Manhattan, but they don't like the other choices that are available to them in a place like uh, um, the, the, by the Tempe or the Phoenix region. And so they're looking for these kinds of environments. Um, there's young professionals sort of who are interested. Um, and then what's most interesting and this is sort of covered by the New York Times article uh, that ran a few months ago um, is that remote workers are starting to think, well, if I can work remotely, maybe I really need to start valuing the neighborhood amenities that the place that I'm, where I'm living can bring. Um, and the original concept to actually locate this project on a light rail line was because there was an expectation that many people would live there and actually commute to jobs in downtown Phoenix. And of course, now they're seeing a lot of their uh, future renters saying, I just want to live here and work remotely and take advantage of this environment uh, that you are creating um, and not need the public transportation uh, to actually go to a remote core place anymore. All right, so you've mentioned um, a lot of the services that cul-de-sac will provide like the um, grocery delivery subscription. Are other services like schools, churches, and grocery stores themselves built into the cul-de-sac development? There is a small retail component and it sort of is neighborhood serving. Um, I think it's about 30,000 square feet of non-residential and that will include a uh, small neighborhood market. It's not a full service grocery store um, as well as uh, some additional sort of food amenities in a coffee shop um, in that phase one. And I think the phase one that's under construction right now is about 16,000 square feet. Um, and this sort of follows that model of more frequently distributed sort of neighborhood scaled amenities uh, that can be sort of very close in terms of walking distance to neighbors and neighborhoods um, uh, that I sort of had mentioned previously. Um, and so those are sort of part of that, um, that mix up. Uh, there are no churches. There is sort of a network of sort of public open space and then there is this network of sort of meeting spaces uh, that are sort of built into the sort of block structure where there's sort of a variety of assembly uses that actually could occur. So that's sort of an interesting experiment to sort of think about um, if um, it can actually be supportive of the way that people actually sort of want to incorporate religion into their lives. I think that's something that actually um, remains to be seen. Okay, quick clarification on that parking. So you said that there were 16 shared stalls, right? And that was about 1000 dwelling units in the cul-de-sac development. And so that would include all of your loading stalls for the you know market that you described, ADA requirements and so on? Yeah, it's. I think there's about 700 units um, in the project, um, if I am not mistaken. Um, the parking spaces are 
basically designed adjacent to the sort of retail, sort of the neighborhood retail um, location. Um, and they are uh, service spaces, loading spaces, and emergency access space is in addition to those uh, 16 spaces. And what we see at cul-de-sac is actually sort of a variety of environments where space is created that's intended to be shared. So for example, the pedestrian paseos that I mentioned that are designed for access to units and for folks to walk and scoot and bike through the project are also designed to accommodate ambulances and fire trucks. Uh, but the idea is that that access would be controlled and restricted so that not everybody can just drive uh, through the streets uh, on sort of on a daily basis. And those are sort of really kind of design solutions that sort of need to occur. Um, but the way in which cars can access the site when they need to is sort of much broader uh, than, uh, than those 16 parking spaces that are sort of tied to the retail area. Great, thanks. We also have a number of questions from our audience members about the roadmap forward. So um, let's say a jurisdiction like one of the counties of Hawaii or the state of Hawaii as a whole wanted to transition to this type of housing. What types of laws would have to be changed, whether administratively, whether legislatively? And what about other important um, requirements that affect development costs, such as fire protection, number of stairways, and that sort of thing. Um, how would all of this come together in a comprehensive way? Yeah, that's a really fantastic question. I think in terms of sort of setting yourself up for success, and I think I wanna sort of acknowledge that we see missing middle housing as sort of a, uh, an important, but sort of not all encompassing component of delivering housing in our communities. Um, it's um, not a panacea, but we see it as a very important component. Um, and that starts sort of in thinking about how to address uh, missing middle housing from a policy standpoint, um, and then sort of how to implement missing middle housing for the tools that communities really have at their disposal which is usually zoning and entitlements, but also can be some other things, um, which I can talk about. So at a policy level, I think it's important to sort of think about and identify if your housing policy is first and foremost limiting or is a barrier to producing this kind of housing. And then what can be done to actually enable this middle housing and be clear and prescriptive about where and how it should be incorporated into your communities. Um, you know, because I mentioned, for example, this is something that we think about that is designed to be compatible with single family environments, but there are a variety of ways that we can think about that compatibility. They could be mixed together, they could be adjacent, we could focus our attention on corridors or old strip malls or old shopping malls and sort of how those can actually be redeveloped. There's a lot of different ways to think about how missing middle housing can be introduced to your communities. And then on the regulatory side, it there are sort of a few layers that I think I sort of would like to sort of talk about. The first one is to sort of understand if you have certain limiting factors to this kind of housing and understand what you can do to actually lift those regulatory burdens. And what we see there is that density parking, and to some degree, standards that are driving building form are often limiting factors to development. So even if you allow multifamily housing, for example, there might be a density cap that actually is limiting the ability for a missing middle building to be proposed because the only recourse for the developer is to build that building with fewer units. You can think about this, for example, if a fourplex is delivering 40 dwelling units to the acre, but it is in a neighborhood that only allows 25, the developer actually might choose to then just build a duplex and build two very large units instead of four smaller units. And those two very large units actually may not actually 
do as well of a job as providing housing that is affordable by design because they are sort of invariably larger units and will be more expensive once they come to the market. That's an example of how a regulation might actually be creating in some situations a, a barrier to missing middle housing that the community may not even be aware of or it may not even be intentional. So that's sort of the first stage. The second step that you could do is to think about introducing new standards to, to promote well-designed uh, missing middle housing. And in many situations, that means that you might need to actually trend your zoning standards towards regulations that are more prescriptive and are more descriptive of what the outcome of the zoning envelope should be. We use the term form-based coding sometimes to talk about zoning tools that actually provide a lot of information about the detailed zoning envelope. We use the term now objective design standards to talk about standards that meet the smell test for projects where discretionary review is no longer possible because of state law or projects need to be defined specifically by objective standards. There's a lot of overlap between those two gaps. A good form-based code, for example, will be 100% objective and meet that tool. But there's also ways that you can think about rewriting or calibrating your standards so that they are objective and can meet that requirement. What the provision of objective standards does is it provides an avenue to streamlining development processes, which can reduce the cost of bringing new housing to market. It can also reduce the time and the rate at which housing can actually be brought. So those are some sort of important sort of things that, that to sort of think about on sort of the zoning entitlement side. There are a lot of communities that are thinking about middle housing and how it can actually sort of meet that second requirement that I described before. It's meeting a niche for middle income housing that is being provided to sort of the middle of the market. And in some situations, that means different kinds of land use and regulatory strategies to open up land to development that actually can start to meet that need. It also might mean that there's sort of a need to create local programs for subsidy um, to um, provide opportunities for um, housing that is at that middle of the market uh, to be built. And that is uh, a problem I think that many communities are starting to discuss now because we have a mechanism usually for delivering at this point, low and very low income housing but the moderate income households are the real challenge uh, for many of the jurisdictions uh, in terms of sort of their ability to sort of consistently provide um, and support that kind of housing. We think in many situations, this missing middle housing can provide a vehicle for that, um, but it really is gonna come down to the local needs of the communities and the tools that actually might be in place I am all supportive for sort of larger sort of state or even federal initiatives to sort of support um, mixed income and middle income housing. And I hope that that continues to sort of develop uh, as we sort of continue this discussion um, around housing need in the US. Well, on that note, um, thank you very much, Stefan. Unfortunately, we're at the end of our hour here. Um, thank you for your generosity of time and for helping to explain a concept that has really taken root on the mainland, especially in the jurisdictions of Oregon and California, as we've already noted. And um, as many of us may not be aware here in Hawaii, has already started, um, I think, the first steps in that direction. Both Oahu and Maui counties have adopted ordinances that permit ADUs on most residential lots. And while these steps have not stopped the housing shortage, have not ended the housing shortage, or even maybe um, caused housing prices to stabilize or go down. Um, as you mentioned, Stefan, they are one component of a, of a multifaceted approach to addressing the housing shortage that we face in 
all of these states, Hawaii, California, and Oregon. So again, thank you for taking the time today and for sharing your experiences with us on these interested, interesting and innovating new developments in housing policy. Thank you so much, Senator Ching. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you and your guests today. Uh, and I wish you the best and hope we can continue this conversation. All right, great. Well, thank you everyone for attending and have a great day.